Hi, welcome to Building SaaS with Python and Django. My name is Matt Lehman, and we build Django apps. On this episode, we're going to work on a new feature for uh, my customer and use some Django views and go over the whole process of creating new features in Django. So that's going to include tests and all of that. If you are going to enjoy that, so stick around um, and you'll see how all that works. If you like what you're watching, uh, you can give me a like or subscribe down below, and that would be greatly help appreciated. And I do want to thank my Patreon patrons, um, Rupert, Abdulaziz, Patrick, Eric, and Philip, uh, and I appreciate your contribution. Um, if you want to help support me financially, you can go to patreon.com slash mblayman and sign up there. So let's get into what we're going to work on this evening. So you're welcome to ask me anything about Python, Django, or web development. That's what I'm here for. And uh, what we're going to focus on is some new feature work that is needed by my customer who happens to be my spouse uh, and that feature is related to backfilling dates on coursework so if you're not uh, familiar with this uh, stream and what we talk about it we're, i'm focused on a homeschool application that i'm building for my family that i'm intending to make available to more people over time uh, but my my wife happens to be the first customer, and she's kind of fleshing out the features that are needed to be, make this tool productive for her environment. And she described to me a scenario that um, is uh, a challenge that she faces with the app, and I'll have to illustrate it um, by bringing up the application. So we're going to launch the app and check it out. So on the application, if I go to... Um, the, the week view, you'll see that there are a bunch of tasks here. And occasionally, um, certain tasks don't happen on the day that they were anticipated. They might happen on a different kind of day. But not every course that is related to the homeschool gets completed on that uh, day, like or, or happens on that day. Some might happen once a week or, or something to that effect. So the challenge is this. the My spouse said, you know, I have a task that is for a course that only happens one day a week. But we got a little off our schedule, and we want to be able to mark it as complete for a different day. So if the task happened to be on a Wednesday for a task for a course that only happened once a week, she wanted to mark it as a Thursday. And the problem is, is that the logic of this week view and this daily view that we have in the app doesn't really make that work well. So we need another ability to do that. And we chatted over, and, and she came to we came to a solution that she liked, and that's what we're going to work on. So we're going to talk about how to do that. And the strategy that we're going to do is to modify one of these pages. And the, this page is the student's view of what their course is, the work that they have left to do. And um, we can show the remaining work, or the work that they've already completed. So it's kind of a record of everything that they have to do. Um, but what my spouse is looking for is an ability to update any of these and mark them as complete at, the, at that time. So uh, what that is going to look like in practice is a new column, um, with, or a new button, I should say. And that button will have a uh, calendar kind of icon by it. And the calendar icon will allow um, her to click on that and set a date for the task. That will mark it as a completed task. So if she misses a day, she could always go into that course view and quickly enter in the date of the task that she wants to complete. So that's that's what we're doing. That's the general plan. We're going to do this um, with some test-driven development. It's going to require some views, some stuff that uh, doesn't exist yet in the code, uh, obviously, um, and as well as some things with the template. And um, we'll start probably by putting this in the template of how I want it to look um, so that we at least have the feel for where this is going to go and then we will add the view that backs that up so that uh, we can we can actually make it work. So uh, we're going to need an icon and I'm, I'm using the uh, Zondicons icon set so if you want to use some free SVG icons this is a great set it's actually I'm pretty sure it's linked to on the Tailwind site so you can check that out too um, but Zondicons is the set that I'm using um, and they, there's this really good page that lists everything. And so the only um, kind of calendar icon that exists is this, this one right here. And we're going to work with that. So I have the template up over here. 
and we're going to add our new section for this new chunk of template code and it's going to be a link but we need this SVG so we're, what I'm going to do to start is to copy in um, the, the button that is going to be needed um, and I believe it's going to be just like this so we're going to try and duplicate or replicate as much as we can to make this as, as efficient as possible and then um, then we'll be able to do the view that's going to back it up. So I'm going to do the silliest thing I can think to do, which is take this tag and just uh, put it here as um, a new new thing and see how that looks. I imagine even that might have um, challenges that we're going to find out. So if we did it right, okay, it looks like this duplicated the button. And as far as I can tell, we still have an appropriate amount of space. We haven't destroyed anything spacing wise by adding the button and there's a uniform amount of space. It looks a little weird right now because there's two plus buttons but um, like in terms of visual layout changes there's there's not much to it yet which is good. Um, that, that means that the pattern that I have for this page is working. Um, what I what I was worried about maybe happening is this might have this might have exceeded the width of the box for this grid and it could have had the buttons wrapping or something and, and that would have been bad and we would have had to adjust it but thankfully that doesn't appear to be the case. So we're going to um, do a split and I have these um, icons already downloaded in a directory so we're going to um, just do the split and get the directory as is. I'm going to go find that calendar SVG and here it is. I'm going to take it and we're going to replace, or the first thing we're going to do is we can close that split and then um, I can put it here. And that would give us the actual calendar icon. Uh, the challenge is right now, um, well, there's two icons. As you can see, I haven't deleted the other SVG. And there are some other aspects that we need to take care of. Um, the namely the fact that we don't have a title for this SVG so that's a problem that's an accessibility problem that no one will know what that icon does without um, clicking on it and you want I want to give them some hover text that's what the SVG title does and we're also missing some class attributes so we're going to take these classes here because they're going to be the same set of classes that we want and we're going to put them on this other SVG and I'm going to take this title as well and put that there and then we can uh, delete this other SVG. Now, doing that is getting closer. It's still not accurate yet, but we should have a calendar icon now, which is good. So now we've got the the feel that we want here. In fact, I looking at this um, and knowing what these are, I know that the plus button is for adding a new task, which is kind of the last thing that people want to think about doing um, when they're uh, considering what to do with a task. So this whole row represents a task. It would be nice, I think, if I could put the calendar icon uh, closer to the actual task itself and leave the plus button at the end as the action that they can take. Um, the other option, well, I, I don't know. I'm looking at, there's this planned completion date, which is, uh, that's interesting. This might might have some wrinkles to it. Um, we're going to see if there are effects to what this means for the layout of um, the weekly and daily views as well. Because now, if I, with the ability that I'm about to add, I mean, I guess this was probably already here in some way, but it'll be much easier to complete some random task in the future, which hopefully doesn't break all of my scheduling logic, but it's always something that we might need to check. So I'm going to switch these two icon orders. We'll take um, this tag and we'll move it up above and so now it should be in this order here which I feels pretty good to me and right now it's going to this create a task page but that's not really what we want so we want to um, what what is the actual action here so I think it's mark or really it's the set the completion date of the task and so that's the idea is like you're setting it for that particular student of this student is now done with it the other thing that we need is um, there are going to be important things to consider here that we might actually want a lot of what's already here in terms of this URL 
So this thing has previous task. It has a next link. Um, there's just a bunch of stuff here that we might want to keep. So I'm not going to delete all of that yet. We, we now have a basically our placeholder. This is where we're going to click to, and it will take us someplace. Now we need to talk about what place it's going to take us to. The um, place we need to consider is a, um, it needs to be a form view, I think. I think that's going to be the right thing. So let me bring up the, the models for just a minute and talk about the piece of data that that uh, the customer actually needs to fill in. So we've got our models and in this setup we have tasks and the tasks are up here and the thing that connects a student, I don't know, I'm a little, little too zoomed in, maybe I can make this slightly bigger so you can see all of it. There we go. So if you look on the left side over here there's this course task and if you look on the right side there's this student and you can see by tr tracing the diagram that they come together as this coursework model. Coursework is the, the thing that joins together a two foreign keys of the course task and the student and adds this extra bit of completed date information. Um, and that is the, the item that we actually want to create or, or update. So if someone clicks that calendar icon, what they're really saying is, I want to mark that my student is done with this task. In other words, I want to create a coursework instance to record the date that they completed the work. So the, the underlying thing that we're trying to build is a form view that's going to do this coursework construction. And it, the, the challenging part is it needs to be a little smart because if they click it and there, there's two, two modes, there's either the, it's either like a create view or it's an update view. And as the names sort of imply, there could be no date associated with it yet because there's no record there yet because the student has not marked that as complete yet. Uh, or there is a desire to change that um, to a date that is uh, maybe it was off by one or just the, the person wants to update it because they didn't actually do it on a particular day. And so we need to make sure that we can account for either of those. They're either updating an existing record or creating a new one. So that's, that's the model relationship that we need to consider. The challenge here is that I want to use a single... Um, uh, yes, I, I'll be using Django Forms for these views. That's, that's correct. I'll, I think what I was about to say is the challenge is that um, there are class-based views that make it easy to do a create view. And there are also class-based views that make it easy to do an update view, but blending them together gets a little bit harder, I think. So it might be because we have, I might have to use a more generic form here. So I brought the classy class-based views site, which is a handy reference because I think navigating the class-based views um, documentation in Django, while doable, is a bit all over the place. And this site kind of brings all of these things together. So we've got these different kinds of views, and I think the form view is probably the most accurate thing that we're going to get because um, because we're trying to do more than one thing with it. So we have the scenario where we have a form that's either valid or invalid, and we just I think our, what we're going to ha happen is our template is going to we'll, we'll just have to fill in all the right details um, and do a query and see if we can find the thing, a thing, and if it doesn't, it's going to have to um, try and create a new one. So I think that's going to be the challenge as we go through this process. So what is this going to look like then? Um, and where is this URL going to be? There's, there's a bunch of things to consider in this design. Is, is what is it that we're trying, where's, where's the URL, like what's the path that we should, should consider? Um, does it really matter all that much? Um, I mean, it, to some degree it does, but uh, that's that's design consideration we'll have to think through. So I want to start maybe with that URL thinking. And I think there are two places that we could put this. We could put this with the, this is all related to students, or is, there's another argument that says that this is related to uh, courses and course URLs. So those are the two candidate homes that I think make sense. Um, when I think about this, though, 
I think the one that makes more sense to me is a um, is in the students area, and the reason for that is um, the two. There are two models, or, or probably there are three models in play. Right? We have the the course task, the student themselves, and then this new coursework model. Two out of those three live in the student's app. So that pushes me to think that this view belongs in this area. And we also have this view for grading stuff anyway, so there's already some interaction with coursework that makes me want to put it there. So I think this is where I want it to go. So what's this path going to look like? Um, well, everything under here, and I'm just going to write this in this file just so you can see it, is like this. It's like students, because that's what all of these views are routed under. And then we're going to have some UUID, which is the going to be the UUID of the student. And then we can say, I, I'm thinking what, what makes the most sense is, um, I think is a task or, or tasks or something like that. And we'll, we would do a, a UUID, another UUID with the course task. Um, and, and those two things together can give us an accurate lookup that gives us the actual coursework that we want. Um, there's going to be some tricky validation here that um, we don't want to create coursework for a course that a student is not in. We don't want to do a lookup for a course task that belongs to another user. We don't want to do the lookup that belongs that the student belongs to another school. Like there's all sorts of validation I think that we're going to get to as we get to this form that we'll have to think through. So what is a seemingly innocuous feature, in my opinion, turns out to be quite a bit of views to consider in, in this process. So let's start with what? Um, maybe we should start with a test. <laughs> what better place to start with than code that proves that things are working? Um, so let's go into the student uh, test views area and we, I'm going to put this, make this thing live right underneath the test course view. So I, I, there's, or the student course view. So there's, there is bound to be, knowing my conventions, a student course view test case. And I'm going to take these first two tests. Actually, this is another, it's a reminder to me to test against another, another user. So that's good. Um, so let's take the first three tests, and then we'll go after this test case class, which is much longer than I realized, and we're going to put this new um, test case. And I'm going to rename it, and I'm going to say this is the student uh, course task view. Um, no, that's... What is this really? This is the... It, the, the thing we're trying to represent is really the coursework view. So let's call it that because that's what we're dealing with. That's the underlying model. Now the URL won't show anything about coursework, but I think let's let's work with the thing that we actually have to consider. So we have an, this unauthenticated view and we're going to need a course task. And we're going to say, um, We'll call this the student's coursework view, and we'll pass it in, and the parameters we want it to have are going to be the uh, course task UUID and the course task. And I think this is the basic form of this, um, but this isn't going to pass yet because this view doesn't exist yet. So we're going to have to dig into this and start fixing things. And I think even that is enough to well, not even let's ignore the other tests yet because we're not ready for them. Uh, but we can we can work from this. So let's put in our URL path, and we're just going to keep doing error-driven development, as I sometimes call it, because that's exactly what we're doing: is um, working through this and following the errors. And this might actually even pass. No. It, it won't, but we'll see why. And the reason it doesn't pass is kind of uh, hard to read error message. It's because this is looking for course UUID, and in the test that we actually we gave it a course task UUID. So we need to correct this uh, name 
parameter here to put that as course task UUID. And now the test passes, but that's only because we have an existing view. Um, I'm going to change this to the, um, well, the best name that I think we have for it is a coursework view. Um, more accurately, it's a coursework form view. Because as I said, we're not gonna, this isn't a create view. It's not an update view. It will have to be in between those use either. And to match conventions on the naming, I, I just usually use the name of the class plus test at the front. So we'll change that as well to get test coursework form view. And you can note probably immediately that uh, this is now complaining that this form view doesn't exist, which makes perfect sense. I've not written that code yet. So we can now come into the and find the student course view. And we want, I'm going to just steal this whole view. Whoops, is that the student course view? Nope, that's the student create view. So we've got the student course view, which has way more code than I want to steal. Um, all right, well, let's just, template's fine for now. Let's come in after this, all this stuff, and put it in here. And this is the coursework form view. That's what I just called it, right? Okay. So now our test should still pass. Why is it passing? It's passing because this test is all about testing if the login required mixin is there. It's checking authentication as, as the test name implies. So what the difference is when we get down to this lower area, this is where it's going to not go so well. Um, so we need, um, I'm going to take the course task that's up here and we're going to supply the course that is above to this course and we're going to rename this thing to coursework and name this as course task and this as course task. Now we've got this view. This might pass as well. This is a get. Hmm. Oh, 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 it's probably um, it's failing in the template because the template is the template is trying to use the the course view, and we're not providing it the right context, which the co course view that template depends upon. So that's that's actually good that um, this is needs to be changed. So let's look at the template. So let's go to the student's course template, and here it is. That was a bad split, I apologize. Um, and notice when we have some of the, some of these, in some of these cases, I do use a convention where there is a create view and an update view. They happen to use the same template, but in other circumstances, I've been able to separate those two because there's a very clear create action that the user wants to do and an, a very clear update action. Um, in this scenario, we don't have that same kind of thing, but we can definitely follow the same pattern of calling it um, the model name followed by form as we do see here with this enrollment form. So I'm going to take this enrollment form because it already has probably, well, maybe that, is there a better one? Um, yeah, it's probably the best we got for now. I'm just going to take this as the, as our starting place and we'll create a new file and we're going to call it the coursework form and I'll paste in some content. Now this content is, is really wrong as you can see, but um, it w should at least allow us to get a passing uh, mark from the test if it's not depending on some context that we didn't pass in. So let's try it again. No, okay. So this, even this one is depending on some data that we don't have. And, and again, I'm, I kind of am using a different file, so it's not surprising 
uh, that it's depending on something. So the pro probably what's happening here, there's a URL, yeah, and it's passing in a school year. But this school year was a none variable, so this doesn't exist, which is why it's failing. Um, so we can, for the moment, just comment this out, I think. I just want to get to a passing spot so we can see it pass and then poke around, um, connect it to the template that we started with, and, and then have something to go to. Okay, so we've got a passing test there, and we now have the ability to go to our course template and come into this area, this first link, and change this. We're gonna change it to students coursework. And it's going to take the, we should have all the bits of data that we need here. Um, can't, this is too small for me to see. Let's get rid of the test for a minute. It's a challenge with streaming is I don't get enough screen real estate, but that's the reality. So it looks like student is already in the context and then we have this task item thing. So we need to pass in the student UUID and we need to pass in the course task UUID of um, course, the task item, there it is, task item, course task UUID. All right, that should be enough. We should be able to come back to our view and refresh it. And now we're, if you can look at the URL, it's kind of hard to read because there's a bunch of extra stuff in there. But we can see that it has the right general form at the bottom. It says students, then along UUID, and then tasks, and then along UUID, and then there's a bunch of other details. And as you can see, um, it says set the completion date of the task, and I, I don't actually like that. I'm going to say completed date because that's what the actual field name is, and that's going to um, be a better message. It's like saying when did you actually do it, not when is it going to be done. Um, so I like that better. So let's hover over it again, set the completed date of the task. So that's the, the telling them what they need to do. Now we can click on this, and it's going to take us to an enrollment form, which is going to look way wrong, because this is completely irrelevant to um, this task. We haven't looked up any of the right data. But we're getting closer. I think what that means, though, is that for now, this is the this, this information is correct for... Um, what am I trying to say? It's correct in terms of the URL, and I think it is going to also benefit from having some of these extra parameters in here to put us at the right spot, assuming we handle next correctly. So there's another requirement probably for our view. Um, yeah. All right, let's return to the tests. And what do we need to do next? What, what other tests do we have here? Let's see, we want to check that we want to make sure that there are certain 404 cases. So there's some error cases that we need to check to. And let's let's talk about, actually, maybe we should just back up and talk about the process. Um, I want to make it so that you can get all the right data first. So if it, if it is the, a valid student, in other words, the student belongs to the user, then that should be okay. If it is a valid task, then that should be okay. Um, we also need to guard and make sure that the student and the task would happen to belong together, which is a more complicated check, but we can probably do that in the form. Um, and, and maybe we can even defer that so that there's not a problem until somebody tries to submit that form because it's going to be a painful thing to check earlier than that. So 
we want to check that those two things are those two primary conditions are true that there's a student and there's a task and they both happen to belong to the the user in some way and if they don't then they get a 404 so this last test is actually kind of correct but really i think it's probably better to just uh, re retake take this test and then redo it with a slightly different data so i'm going to take this and i'm going to say um the, the part that we do want to get is the response and we don't want to do a get check 200 because we don't definitely want to check for a 400 so or excuse me a 404 response so we're going to paste that there and then i'm going to delete this test because ever everything else about it is not what we need and we want to say um, other user student and um, a student belonging to another user is a 404. Um, okay, w why? Um, this is just good sanitary it's just like protection to make sure that people can't access other people's stuff um there are probably not going to be many people that would want to even try but you know people write scripts write bots they try to find exploits and sites and <clears throat> yeah so that that is one one facet um code alite is that how you say it codial codialite code 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 Ali Tay. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where to the, where to break that. But um, so yeah, that what you're suggesting in the, your question there is one of the checks that we'll put in the form to um, to make sure that the student and the task go together. Um, but this one is a is more basic of in in the actual model diagram, um, which I'll I'll open up again just because it's useful as a as a visual reference. Um, when we have a student. Where is the student? The student's way over here. If you look at the student um, model, I don't know how well you can all see that. I'll only zoom in. There is a foreign key to the school, and the school is owned by an admin, which is a, a user account, which is owned, you know, is a user. So um, that that is what I want to check that that student um, is actually, you know, somebody that is associated with that user account. So that's one check. That's what actually what this test is about. So we want to, in order to prove this, the simplest way to do it is we want to delete this association right here. I'm just going to take that out. And so now the student that's generated, um, the factory is going to create a different user that is with it. So it's not, it shouldn't be the right thing. But this test at the moment is going to actually pass. Um, because we're not actually checking for this data. We're not doing any lookups on this kind of stuff. All right, I suspect it will pass. Yeah, all right, I, mean, I meant, sorry, I meant fail. <laughs> I said, I totally said the backwards thing. Um, so it's doing a 200 when it should be doing a 404. So now we have the test. Now we can go back to our view and beef it up to have the right stuff. Um, so the way... This is going. The starting point is we want. We're going to want the student to be in the context because we need to set the form correctly, um, and it might not even be visible. Well, yeah, we'll probably display it somewhere. So it'll say like um, set something about complete, or I'll, I'll probably connect them together. The the task and the student somehow in the title to say what to do. Uh, so this is what we we need to return the context, and that'll still fail, as I would expect. But now we can do a little bit more. We can um, create. We can try and fetch the student. So the student is the is the UUID. So we need to fetch the student, and we want to say student dot objects dot filter and it's going to accept a UUID and the UUID is going to come from self um, keyword args and we'll pull out UUID 
And I have confidence that those will be in the keyword arguments because um, it's we've already connected the URL properly to name the parameter. So I can do that without kind of worrying that I'm going to get a key, key error in this regard. So if I did it this way, actually, instead of a filter, we want more than that. We want a get. No, 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 no. That's not what we want. There's another, there's a helper method called get, get object or 404. This is what we really want. So let's come back to this area. I, I kind of goofed this up. Get object or 404, and you pass it the, the model type. And then as a set of um, keyword arguments, you pass it the extra data. So this now says, look at the student table and find the object, the student record, and if it, you can't find it, return a 404. Um, and I want to add the, the student to the context, so we'll do this. Um, and it should make my editor stop being angry at me too. All right, but still, this is broken right now. I haven't, and I'll show you why. Uh, we'll run the test, and it's still passing. It's still doing a 200. Why? That's because I haven't added the right filtering. So the other thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we don't um, allow filtering just any student, which is the case right now. We're, we're grabbing any student that matches that UUID, but we want to make sure that that student is also part of the school. So we take the school and we take the, we go to the, uh, we can do it this way. We can say admin and we take the self user. So that's going to take the user attribute from this view, the authenticated user, and do a query on it. Now I would expect that the test would pass because now we're filtering and saying like you have to be part, that student has to be part of the school from the user in order to, for this to work. Ooh. Um, Course form view, coursework form view has no attribute. Oh, 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 I'm, I'm, it's been a while since I've written a view. So this is actually hanging off the request object. So the, the, the class view does have a request attached to it and the user is attached to the request. So that now passes. And while we're at it, since I know I'm going to want to have the student in the context, I find it helpful to go back and say, in the the basic get test that's what this first test is is a sanity check of it is everything okay and so this is a good spot for me to assert on what's in the context so we'll say self get context and we'll look for the student and that's for that second that third line that i did there that's the assigning the student variable to the into the context dictionary and I like to arrange it as the actual and followed by the expected value. Although there's nothing that says you have to do that. And that test passed too. So that means that the, the data is in the context as this line right here indicates. So now we have a student to work with. That's good. We have the confidence that that student is also protected. So that's what this test is for. I think the next test we want to do is essentially um, redo, take this again as the starting point, or mm, how, now is where we, we, we could do this a number of ways. Let's try take this one because it's a little bit closer in form. And we want to check that, um, so this test is, this one's going to be called other user task. So a task belonging to another user is a 404. And we do want to use the same, the student that passes. I don't want to mix them up and get the wrong 404. So um, hopefully, let's run this test to make sure it's failing. This should be a 200. Yep, and it's returning 404. Or excuse me, it's returning a 200, and it's expecting a 404. And we want to now change it so that it's just some random task. So let's delete that. In fact, um, because we're deleting that, we don't actually even need this. We're just having some random task somewhere. And that's still going to fail because we haven't actually fetched out that uh, chunk of code yet. So let's get that now. Let, now that we have the student, we can also do um, 
we can get the course task. And we're going to do basically the same pattern of we're going to do it in a get object or 404. We're going to say course task. And we're going to do, it's going to be a little bit more complicated because of the relationship and the modeling, but we'll, we'll work with it. But the first step is to do a UUID and self keyword args on this time it's the course task UUID. We have to be a bit more specific because of how I named it in the URL. And I'll say uh, context of course task, because this is another thing that we're going to need in the actual template, is a course task. And it looks like we don't have the course task available in here, so we will need to um, import that. So let's go do that. So coming up to here, we're going to add the course task model. Uh, this view should still fail because I haven't done the proper filtering, so it's still passing and, and getting anything. We what we really need to do is um, this is where the association is a little harder. There's a many-to-many -many relationship in this mix that makes it so that we can't do a direct lookup on this. We have to get out the set of um, grade levels. It just, it's a little bit more complicated. So um, just kind of trust me that this, this is where the, my modeling knowledge happens to uh, of this particular system happens to come into play. So we're going to have to look up um, the grade levels that belong to this user and check if this course tasks course is in one of those grade levels. And if that didn't make much sense, don't don't worry too much about it. Um, so start with grade levels. And we might even just need um, grade level Well, let's keep it simpler. It doesn't doesn't really matter. I don't I don't want I think we don't need to over optimize this. So we're gonna say grade level and objects filter. And now uh the grade level has, as you can see from my Vim editor there, it's got a school year parameter. So we can say school year school admin is equal to self request user. It's going to give us all of the grade levels. And then we will take the grade levels and we'll come down to this course task filter and we're going to say um, course uh, grade levels in this one right here. That should be it. So it's a more complicated filter. It's a little bit annoying. That's just how the nature of sometimes the modeling for what the customer needs is something more difficult to work with. Um, but that's that's the reality of it. Now this test should pass because this filter is now in place, and this course task is the factory is going to create a course which is going to create a grade level, which is going to create a different, like a whole different tree of, of stuff, and it's not going to match. So that when we, when we get uh, look at this line right here, that filter is not going to match anything, and it's going to throw a 404, as we expected. All right, but the get should still pass because it's still wired together. Because th in this scenario, this course task belongs to this course, which belongs to this grade level. You kind of trace it up like a tree. So um, again, if, if it's your first time watching this stream, it's uh, the task is sort of the bottom or one of the bottom things, and then course, and then grade level, and then school year, and then school, and then finally all the way up to the top of the, the person that owns the school. So the other thing we want to do is we want to assert that the course task is in the context and it's the course task from above. All right, great. So what do we have? We have, um, we have the data. We have not set up the template 
at all, really, at this point. Um, but that's okay. But we have everything we need, and we've done the additional checking. So I feel like we have the adequate coverage so far. Now, here's where we need to do more. Um, and here's where it's going to get more complicated. This is going to become a form view. And coming back over here, form view is going to require a handful of properties. And um, we're going to need to feed the form view some initial data. The form doesn't exist yet, so we might have to like detour and create the form first. Uh, because if I try and create a form view, well, let me just try it. Let me show you what that looks like. So we're going to take this template view and we're going to change this to a form view. And uh, the template, the form view derives from um, a template view, or it's got the template response mix in. So this template name is still correct, um, but that's this is the form view that we're going to need. And we need to import that. So I believe that's in the generic category. We can import it here. I think that will be right. And now if we return to the test, and try and run this test, we're going to get a failure. And the failure is um, really unclear. Wow. Um, that's too bad. It should, it should be better than this. I, I think in the past it has been. I, you can still kind of see it, but the problem is here that there is no form class so a lot of times Django is pretty good about actually giving the message and I'm surprised that it gave this kind of um, this error this very generic none type error but you can look at this and you can you can see this chunk of code and see where it's coming from the form class is none and so it's trying to instantiate a none which doesn't work um, and that's because I haven't supplied any form class. So we need to, in order to make this work, we need a form class as a class level attribute. But what goes here? That's the problem, is we don't have anything that goes here yet. So I'm going to leave this as none and mark this as to do um, and say insert form class. So we need to take a detour and go and down a level and create a form. So we need, as my view name ho hopefully clearly implies, we need a coursework form. What is the coursework form going to take as attributes? It's going to take um, it's going to need as it's doing verification it will need the student and it will need the task. I'm trying to think if it will also need the user. I don't think so because I think from, if we already have the student, we can do the lookup of the user if we need to. Um, we'll see. For the, for the time being, I'm gonna assume that we only need those two things. And Yeah, we're gonna need more. We're gonna need more, <laughs> but we'll we'll work with this for now. And if you got any questions, um, please feel free to ask. As again, this stuff gets a little, um, a little goofy. Would it be the same validation as the test? Um, well, no, so, sort of. It could it could be. We could push this validation down into the form that I've done on this get object or four hundred four. Um, my general feeling is that that views, the view layer in Django, is where you want to deal with HTTP status codes. Um, the reason for that is if you try and if you try and use, for instance, get object 404 deep in your code, then there's going to be this future where, well, I can't guarantee this, but there's a likely future where you depend on some code. And for whatever reason, your business logic raises a 404 in a context that that doesn't matter. Here's a good scenario. Um, maybe I make a form that uh, does a bunch of stuff and is really useful. And then I have to do um, some background processing. Like I, I create either start celery or some kind of other background task management system. And I want to 
reuse a form that's similar, but I happen to have put in this get object or 404. Well, if there's a failure to look up the object, it's going to raise an HTTP 404 in a non-web context, which is really um, confusing. So I think for me, what that means is like leave the HTTP handling at the view layer. And so 404 raising is here. And then I'm going to pass this stuff into the form um, and assume that let the, the form have the knowledge that this has already been validated and have real records that are matter. Um, but your question about the same validation, you asked earlier um, if the, where was it? Uh, you asked if the, I think, if the task is belonging to another student. Um, and, and this is where the form can do that checking of, you know, we're, the, the coursework form is about creating or updating an instance of a, a student and task combination. And what we do need to check in the clean method is that those two things are allowed to be coupled because if the student is not actually um, enrolled in a course that has that task, then we want to raise an error there. So hopefully that, that clears it up for you, uh, code, code Alite. Um, that's what I'm going to call you. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your handle. Um, okay, so I think we're ready to go to the form. It means uh, we have to write some tests for that as well. And um, yeah, that seems like a good, good enough place as I need it to keep going. And I think what that's going to do, I guess I'll add, is that this is going to clean this up later. Like this, this context data, is, it's kind of big for, for what you want in a context data. Um, there's a lot of like filtering that's happening here and like it, it just gets a little sloppy, a little messy. Um, and I, I think as we build the form, um, this is going to get, it's going to get tricky as, as actually now that I think on this more, no, 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 I'm, I'm overthinking it. Hold on. Sorry. <laughs> Apologize. I'm getting ahead of myself. So one thing at a time, let's work on the form. So we have a forms file right now. There's just this enrollment form in here. And we need, um, what do we need? We need, we need a coursework form. So it's gonna, I'm gonna put it right here above the enrollment form. So let's also, while we're here, open up this other file. And so we want a new test case. And we're gonna call this the coursework form. And what is our first test gonna be? Um, how about a happy path test that validates? So uh, we'll say def test is valid. And we will, what we want to do is we want to check that um, the coursework validates. Um, I don't know, that's kind of a crappy doc string. We'll maybe work on that later. So um, none of this stuff exists yet. So let's just pretend that it does and see the like optimal test. Um, see if that that's, feels right or not. And this, this is actually causing me to like rethink. So we're, if we use a model form, which is I think what I want to do, the model form gets some parameters and it gets those parameters from a variety of places. Um, yeah, this is going to get interesting. So let's just start. We want our form. It's going to be a coursework form. We want to say, um, is this valid? And we want to call form is valid and assert that it is valid. Seems easy so far, right? This is not meant to be difficult at this stage. So the thing that we want is it's missing a coursework form. So we need to come into the forms and we need to import it. So now we have this, but my editor notices, oh, wait a minute, you don't actually have that form. 
So we want to have this and have um, a coursework form. But we don't want the enrollment. We want the coursework. That's what we want this to be based off of. The other thing that we are wanting in this, like when we're building a coursework, there's not, not many fields on it. Um, let's bring up the coursework model so you can see it. It's just a handful. We have a couple foreign keys and a uh, completed date field. And we need all three in order for this to be successful. So we need the student, we need the course task, and we want the completed date. Those are the three fields that are going to go into our form. So we also need to import the coursework model to make the form all hang together. If I run this now, it's still not going to pass. Okay. The reason for that is, um, well, it's not a, it's a, it's what's considered an unbound form. So uh, when form validation runs, it's trying to validate against something, right? It has to validate against actual data. And we haven't provided any data yet, so it doesn't know what this is. And so minimally, we'll have to provide a dictionary of data and bind that. And binding it is just a fancy way of saying setting it in the constructor uh, to a data attribute. And now by doing this, even though I don't have any type information here, let's get this to shut up for a minute, um, we now have a bound form. It's still going to be wrong though. And this is where we're going to want to look at, we'll probably just do it this way, this might be easiest, to do print out the form errors. So the printing out of the form errors is telling us what we're missing. Okay, we're missing the student. We're missing the uh, course task. We're missing the completed date. We're missing all of them. Um, no surprise, I didn't actually pass them in. So we need in um, this data dictionary, we need to add those data attributes. And so the course form, the model form, is going to expect some primary keys. Um, <clears throat> how do errors come in HTML? Uh, that's a good question. The errors are in HTML because that is the default printout for the errors. So um, when you when I printed form errors, it calls the um, what method does it call? It calls the excuse me the the stir method. Um, Hey, welcome. Glad you're back. Um, and so the, I, I don't, I still think I can't say your handle, Scalileo. Scalileo. You all have difficult handles for me to say. Um, so code, code Alite, this is, uh, when you have a stir method, like it's wanting to print out the HTML. And the reason that Django wants to do that is because uh, Django kind of expects that in your template, you want to do the simplest thing possible and just say form. And it's trying to dump out, like, let you be as quick as possible of just saying, here's my uh, table of information for my form. And say cello and then cellio. Cello. <laughs> Maybe I should write it down and practice it some other time. Um, so the the point is is uh we uh we need to add all these attributes in and and so the sorry i'm getting a little off track i apologize the um the html is there just to make it convenient to do template rendering um when i print it in my test that's why you're seeing it that way uh it's because I, it's call in the process of calling the print on it it's running through the stir method which happens to go through that path of saying, oh, you must want this to be rendered out, which is, and it defaults to that um, HTML version. Hopefully that answers your question, Code Alite. Um, okay, so we, what we need in here is the stir of um, a student ID, and we need the course task, 
um, uh, and that's going to be the st string representation of the course task ID. And if you're being observant, I, the, none of these things exist yet. That's okay. Um, and then we need a date. And so we'll need a string, and we'll put in today's date of 2101.27. And that should be enough. But, ah, except I can't make a dictionary apparently. We need completed date as the last key. And now my editor is rightfully complaining and says, wait a minute, you don't have um, you don't have a student yet, so what what's up, man? What are you doing? Uh, so let's let's actually let's build this appropriately so that we don't get bit in the future and have to come back and fix all this junk. We're gonna need a user because our clean method is gonna want to validate that in fact, we probably just want all of this stuff um, because we need a user, we need a, a student and a course task that are both connected to the same user. And so it has to go through this tree to get it all right. So that just is the unfortunate part of the structure. It requires more factories than I like. Um, yeah, that's just what we have to do. So the students factories is going to be the place for two of these factories. So we want the... Um, student factory that handles that and then we need to bring in from homeschool courses tests factories import the um, course factory and the course task factory okay great so what do we have now we have valid data actually I think this test might pass Hey, it passes. And maybe it didn't see it, so I'll do it again. Um, this is why writing form tests are cool. They're faster. They're not a ton faster. Well, they're, they're maybe a ton faster than that, those view tests we were writing. So the view tests execute quite a lot of code. It's executing through the URL routing system, getting the view code, getting the view, running through the view, um, doing a template render, all of that stuff. And so the timing... Now this is reading back as 0.39 seconds, and this test was not that. Oh, well, it's still failing right now, but um, it was something when it was passing of like 0.7 or 0.8. It might seem insignificant, but when you have a larger and larger test suite, those, you, those chunks of time, half a second here, half a second there, those start adding up. And so that's really a good advantage to writing um, form tests. If you can get write your tests closer to where um, they're running so they execute less code, then your test suite ends up being faster. Um, so just a hot tip there for if you want a fast test suite. So now we have this path that is the happy path through this validation. Um, and so that's, that's great. That's what we want. Um, now we're ready to move on to the next piece of this. Or, or maybe maybe before we do that, maybe we should hook in the form into the view. That's probably the right call. So let's return to our views. And we'll go down here and we'll add the coursework form. And we'll come down to this... Um, well, where to go? Coursework form and change it to have coursework form. Okay, cool. Let's return to our test view. I think this might still fail. Maybe not. I don't know. Oh, passed. All right, there's the there's your time example. So it took 0 0.71 versus 0 0.39. Um, Three tenths of a second, but again, those add up if you're running a bunch of tests. So what do we have to do next? Let's maybe pause so I can give myself a, an opportunity to think for a moment. Ultimately, if there, because remember, there are two modes. Uh, that, that someone coming to this link. And, and for those of you joining late, like the context of what the heck am I doing is 
Um, let me launch the, the app and so you can see it. My spouse was asking for a place to add coursework, add calendar dates. And I'm on this page that shows the student and all of their stuff. And she wants the ability to go into any of these things and click on an icon, in this case, this little calendar icon, that lets her add in the date for the, that she completed a task at any time, whether it's on a schedule or not. So that's, that's what we're doing, if, if you missed it. So this is the view that we're trying to fill out. We're copying from this other form. And so we have the data now, um, and we have the form now, but there's still more to do. And I'm wondering, like, the, the two different, of the two different modes, the create path and the update path, what, what needs to go into that uh, in order to make, that, uh, make it all to come together? But I think before we do more work on the view, perhaps it makes sense to do the bit of extra validation that I think will be necessary. So I mentioned that um, we're going to have to check that the student and the task are even allowed to go together. So that's the extra test we want to write. Um, we'll say student can create coursework. And the student is enrolled in a course that contains the task. That's the condition that we want to check. Uh, so we're going to have to like walk backwards through the path and check that the yeah check that those things match up and this is also bringing in some other interesting challenges as of like earlier i had said that we were getting the student and the course task in the context but take a look at this like when when we are doing, when we're passing in the data, we're doing it from a lookup on, on this. So the, the model view wants to get this data and say like, okay, the student exists because I was able to look it up from the ID. Um, but the, the form view is going to be providing it from a UUID. So I'm honestly blanking out a little bit on what we need to pass in is it a keyword argument? I think there they might be keyword arguments that go into this, um, or form arguments. I'm I'm drawing a blank. We'll have to I, every time I come back to form views, I, I sort of forget some of the parameters. So we'll have to play around and see what it is because I think this is the right thing in order to like get out this stuff so I can use this in the context and render it properly. Um, but in terms of building the form and doing proper validation and providing this data ahead of time, um, we have a there's going to be different strategies on whether it comes from the data that's posted by the user or or the data from the URL yeah yeah that's actually that's really interesting okay I'm, I'm again getting ahead of myself I apologize so um, we want to test we know that this path is valid um, good. Okay. Yeah. Why are you UIDs in the models? It's a security issue. Um, by using UUIDs for, and, and really, like, I think it's fine to use UUIDs in the uh, regular IDs, regular primary key IDs in the models. I think that's totally okay. Where UUIDs are strong is if you have that in your URLs. So imagine, um, imagine I had this. So that instead of these long UUIDs, I had students, well, there was a UUID there, something like this, students one. Um, this, if you do this, you actually open yourself up to something called an enumeration attack, which means that if somebody figures out that you're looking up information about um, some kind of data in your system and you do it based on the primary key, then they can very quickly figure out a lot of data about you potentially, um, especially if you don't authenticate these properly. Like if it if it was just like anybody could get into this and just look at the data, then somebody 
with a pretty stupid Python script could say students one, students two, students three, students four, students five, and pull all of your data out of your database just by enumerating over that until it got to the end and said, you know, 404, there's nothing left. Um, so they could figure out exactly how many of something they had in there. Um, they could figure out data about it if it wasn't protected very well. In fact, I believe this is what happened. Uh, the social media website Parler, I'm not going to get into politics of all that stuff, but Parler itself, when there was this big data breach, um, it's kind of what happened to them is I believe that they had a bunch of their APIs kind of open with using this primary key approach. And it was, it's, it's basically taking advantage of this thing called an enumeration attack. And it's called that because you enumerate through the numbers uh, just to figure it out. So by having uh, UUIDs, that becomes pretty much impossible. There's no way to guess what the next one's going to be. Yeah, gr glad you appreciate the, the explainer. Uh, so that's why I use them as a, as a safety measure in the system. Okay, so we want to our test here to come back and I want to test this is the actually the negative case so I want to test that um, we've already test got a check for well no that's in the view so we want to check that this user student and is part of this course in fact I think this would when I'm finally done this is going to fail this this first test is going to fail. We'll see why. So let's take all the same data, because it's a good starting point, and we'll copy it into the new test. And this time we want to assert that this is not valid. Okay. The other thing that's missing is we want to do base this off of an enrollment. So the enrollment is that the student and the student is enrolled in the grade level. So that's what else is missing. So we want an enrollment to connect the two. So we'll do an enrollment factory, and it's going to take student equal student and grade level equal grade level. The enrollment is just a model record that connects the dots between those two. Um, so now that the student is enrolled in the grade level and the course is part of the grade level, then those things come together and um, that shows that um, everything's wired appropriately. In fact, this is what we want, actually we want to put up here um, for the happy path test and we want to have removed, we explicitly want to break that connection down here. And so we want this test to fail but it's not going to fail right now. It's going to be true because we haven't put any clean method in there. So now it's time to come back to where? Come back to the form. And now we want a clean method. And we'll say, take this stuff. I'll call the super clean on it. Just sounds like a cleaning product, super clean. Um, the reason you call clean on it is to make sure that the clean data is populated, I'm pretty sure. And we want out of here the um, student. So self clean data get uh, student. And we also want the um, course task. There are a couple of weird scenarios that can happen here. Both of these could be none. Um, I'm trying to think if I want to even get down to that level on this stream this evening because it's sort of boring. It's just like you can pass in a bad UUID and it could potentially fail here. I don't know if this is worth really protecting because I'm going to pull this from the URL eventually. I don't know. It's just getting... I'll put a note and then we'll just leave it. I'll ignore it for now. Um, or I, I'll ignore it on the stream and you guys don't have to worry about it, but I'll, I'll fix it up later. It's not very exciting stuff. So um, just know that when you're dealing with clean methods, 
there are cases where the form in its collection of those model instances could come back as um, none, and that's not good. So I do at least want to put these in a, a gar that says that both of these things are truthy, uh, which means that they are actual records. And because if we try and do operations on these and they don't meet those conditions, then that's not so good. Um, and for the moment, we'll just say pass. So we now have a clean and I, I don't, does the clean have to return anything? Return the clean data, I think. Um, yeah, sure. I don't remember if that's actually part of the API or not, but I'll follow suit with what's down below. Okay, now we need to write the test that I was talking about. So we, we need to check that this student and this course task are allowed to be connected. And if not, we want to raise a validation error. So um, what does that look like? We want to check what? The could go up. So we could get the the student has a school attached to it. Look at the student models. There's a should be a school property attached to the student itself. Oh my word, too much stuff in here. Yeah, there's a foreign key to the school. And we haven't actually fetched that at this point, so but we do have a the actual key. So the I guess we want to check if there's an existence relation. Okay, I think I got it. Um, what's this going to look like? So we want a, it's going to come back to the grade levels again. So we'll say grade levels. It's a little bit similar to the code that's in the view, which just feels like a bit repetitive, but I don't know. I haven't quite managed... There's probably some abstraction that I'm missing to kind of wrap this up that I'm struggling to I'm struggling with. And and sometimes the struggle is what you want to be there until you get the right thing in your head for how do I model this appropriately? And I'm getting tired of doing these intermediate grade level checks, but I'm not sure what to replace it with. Um so I'll get, I'll get there eventually. So we'll say um for now, we'll we'll do the same kind of filtering that we have been doing elsewhere. And we're going to look for a grade level is connected to a school year, as I've mentioned. And so we've got the school, and we can say student school ID. Notice the ID part. Um, if you just say dot school, what that you're going to cause the, the ORM to do is a, a lookup at that moment, because it, it assumes you actually want the school record. In this case, I don't care about the school record. I don't actually, I don't want anything from it. I just want the identifier, the, the fact that it exists because I want any grade levels that are part of that school. So I don't need the school itself. I just need which school. And so if you use the underscore ID attribute, you bypass the ORM and you say, give me the numeric value, the foreign key, and, and that should be enough. So by saying, doing this kind of filter here, um, that's going to give me, the, the right data. Let's go ahead and bring in the grade level as well. Um, that's in the schools app. So from homeschool schools models import grade level. Okay. So we've got the grade levels that this belongs to and we want to now check um, uh, if the task is, is correct. So is task in hmm this isn't I'm I'm doing this wrong I can already see it it's it's even more more tricky than than I'm thinking here and I think I might be going about it backwards let me let me back up I right, remember what I said the enrollment is actually the connector between the um the grade level and the student so I think what I really want is I, I don't want all the grade levels that could ever be part of the school. So this is not the right code. I want to take the enrollment. And I've already got that in model imported, which is probably telling me it's probably a good signal that I'm doing the right thing. So let's first get the enrollment for the student. So um, 
But which enrollment? Ooh, this gets even trickier. Um, what are we really checking? We have to bring together two pieces of information. Do the course task and the student go together? So what we're, ah, I got it. All right, finally got it. We want to find out if there is an enrollment such that the student and the course tasks grade level exist. That's, that's what it is. So the final answer is going to look like some kind of enrollment objects filter um, exists check. That's, that's what we care about. Um, and then it's like is valid task is, is what I'll probably call the variable. Um, so we want to pass in what's the what's the first thing the easy one's the student we know that we have a student already that's going to be part of this the other thing we want is the grade level for the course task so we need to find um, we need to look look backwards from the course task and say what grade levels are um, contain the course Gosh, that, I don't know why this, I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around this particular problem. So, grade levels. I think that's the thing that we need, needs to come out. And how do I do that reverse query? Or it's a many-to-many -many field. Okay, let's go get, let's go look at some other stuff because I'm not remembering everything appropriately. Let's go to the course task. So the course task has a foreign key up to the course. That's that's fine. So let's look at the course. The course um, has a many-to-many -many field to the grade levels. So maybe... Ah, I think I'm overthinking this. I think it's going to look like this. We want the enrollment where the grade levels is equal to the course task course grade levels dot all. Actually, it's not just equal to, we want it in. So if there is an enrollment that has the student and has the grade level in that collection, then it's a valid task. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I know this is very specific to this app. It's not super like Django-y, but it's, this is the, the logic that I'm trying to apply. And so what was this? This was a, um, I'm taking the instance, I'm going to the foreign key, I'm looking up the course, um, which means I'm probably going to do more lookups than I want, but that's okay. It's a one or two extra queries is fine. There's a many-to-many -many field on that course record. So this is a many-to-many -many related manager. And that is why we have to call all on it. You can't just say grade levels because it's not going to do the right thing. Um, passing that information in and check, doing an existence check on that tells us that, there, in fact, this student and this course task are connected to each other through an enrollment. Um, hmm, that's an interesting thought there. Yeah, I think I think the the, the important it's, it's a really interesting question. I'm I'm not sure that that question really applies to my particular product. Maybe we can general. Maybe you're looking for a broader answer about a general case, but I'll just, I'll explain why I don't think that matches for my product. Um, this product is about homeschools. So unless you have ten thousand kids in your homeschool, um, Maybe somebody does. Maybe say maybe maybe somebody would try and apply this application to ten thousand kids. I think it would fall over long before it got to that point because it's not really designed for that. Um, as I, I've tried to show it, I don't really have it up right now. But um, the the interface for managing a weekly schedule shows uh, like a big screen per student of all of the individual's tasks. Um, 
yeah, I, I just really haven't designed the app with that like sheer number of um, people in mind because of who I'm targeting. I'm targeting what amounts to homeschool families. So um, there are really big families out there. I get it. So there's, you know, upper bound, maybe 10. Um, but even the, in the scheme of like an application, 10 is a tiny number, right? Like computers have no problem handling 10. I do agree that if it was 10,000, that would be a different scenario. Um, but I, I don't think that's going to be the case. Now, there are um, there are things called, uh, what are they called? Homeschool co-ops, um, cooperatives, which is a collection of homeschool families who get together. Maybe, maybe there's a future where this product tries to work with a co-op. And so at that point, then I'd have um, probably an individual who acts as kind of like the principal or the uh, manager for that cooperative. And uh, that person administrates who's in the co-op. But I think it, I think what that person's view would be would be very um, limited compared to the rich data view of the day-to-day -day of what is, a, what is a parent showing to their kid and what do they have to track so you know i guess my answer to your general problem is at some stage you have to limit the amount of data i think that's the strategy um, you look at big apps and the way that lots of big apps do it is through the notion of um, paging so you get to see a page of data at a time um, that breaks down if you want a big code dump as you like you you know you're talking about with the csv format or whatever um, so there are, can be expensive operations in a system. Um, I just don't think that they truly really apply for this context. Hopefully that answers your question, uh, Chelio. Did I get it? Chelio? Um, and, uh, um, you get some idea from that. Um, okay. So looking at this clean method, finishing this up, we've now got this Boolean state and we want all right, so we, I don't even think we need to assign to a new variable. I think we can actually put this check in this if statement. So if we have a student and if we have a course task and if this condition is not true, right? Does that sound right to everybody? Because this is all the, this is the, the case that we're trying to create. Um, so yeah, I think this is, I think this is right. And then we change this pass to raise a validation error that says, um, something helpful. Um, what should it say? The student is not enrolled in this course. I think that's probably the most accurate statement. Ah, okay. Best strategy for building a dashboard in Django. Um, yeah, kind of, again, sort of comes down to your problem space a little bit uh, and what you're trying to display. I think a lot of it does have to do with, again, what I said about paging, like the recognition that there are, there are reasons that forum software have like 20 or 30 replies and then say next page. And the reason is database performance. They don't want to show um, a million records or, you know, like some of these conversations can go on for a very long time. I'll give you a, a for instance, um, my last job. So currently I work at Dr. On Demand and we don't have this problem. It's a different kind of company. My last job was at an ed tech company and, and it was a, a space where um, middle school kids primarily were uh, being taught creative writing skills. So the ability to write um, books and, you know, like short picture books or long form chapter books, whatever, um, in this very imaginative dynamic way. I won't get into all the details, but the important part there was um, there was a commenting feature. And in the commenting feature, um, you could add your thoughts and share and celebrate somebody's book or say, get, provide some helpful feedback. It was a very family friendly kind of place. Um, but what we found was there was a segment of the population. This Again, this was targeted at at uh, teenagers or middle school, so kind of tween age. And 
some of these users found that they could use this commenting feature as essentially a chat room. Um, so they would take, they would create a book and they would put silly things in the book. And like they, these were like primarily tween girls. So like 12, 11, 12 year old kind of girls who wanted to chat with each other. And so they'd make these silly books and just like treat it like a chat room, comment after comment after comment. So there'd be thousands of comments. And this, this one behavior, it was a small cluster of people, but uh, they were even given like a name and stuff because they were such a small demographic that they, they had undue influence on the rest of the platform because the way that we pretty much always dynamically loaded comments is that it got to be very expensive. Uh, and our comments database table was one of our biggest tables within the product, part, partly because these people would use this functionality as a chat room and, and database tables as good as they are with database indices and all this stuff, they start to hit limits um, on, on certain things. Uh, so in that scenario, this is, this is probably about as close as I can get to your, your story. It's not quite a dashboard, but it's a ton of data. And, and I think that's, that's the real problem is like, how do you deal with this data? And the best we could manage was to do a page, do a chunk of it, like a, an offset of, I want this comments from here to here. Um, and I think that can apply to a lot of uh, tabular kind of information, which is, I think, what dashboards are generally uh, most likely to display. Now, what happens when you need all of the dash, dash data to represent your dashboard? I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, that 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 gets where it's where it gets tricky. Is if you if in order to make the complete picture, you need every bit of data. Um, that's that's tough. Oh, you're welcome. Um, okay, let's see if we got this test right. Oops. Uh, nope, we didn't. Okay, grade. I said. What did I say? Ah, I said grade levels, and it's grade level, I think. Yay, cool. All right, so we've got that, and now let's also make sure that the the error itself is what we want. So let's, um, let's, what is this going to be? Assert form and non-field errors, I think is the function. And we want this to be student is not enrolled in this course. Hopefully I got that syntax right. I did, cool. Okay, and if you've never seen this before, um, there's we're, we're doing all of this in the clean method and in forms in Django, you can have clean field, uh, methods that are per field. So if I made a clean student field, for example, um, and raised a validation error, then it would go into a specific error type. And the the thing that we printed out earlier, um, uh, Code, Code Alite was asking about HTML tables and stuff. Um, the form errors are, are, if you look at it as a data structure and don't try and do the string wrapper on it, it is keyed by the actual field names. So we could look at it, access it like um, form errors and then student if there was a problem but that doesn't work on the generic clean method the generic clean method puts them in a special field um it's a double underscore it would be they put it in this name by default double underscore all double underscore and those these are referred to as the non-field errors they're not related to a specific field and accessing this way and remembering this under all not everybody does that so there's a method that gives you all those errors out of that dictionary. Um, so it's probably, what I've done here is probably equivalent to roughly like this with the string again, you know, but I didn't do that. I used the non-field errors. So that's what that's all about. Okay, so we have, what do we have? Um, oh great, we didn't need to use the grade level thing. Awesome. I love not importing from other Django apps. 
we've got a form. We've got uh, a form that validates that the task and thing are, are correct. And that's all good. Um, we have the... We don't have... We're not actually going to be using the create view or update view um, our cell uh, directly. So we have to do some of the functionality that those things would do manually. So um, a Django uh, form view is when it calls form valid. Actually, that's a good question. Let's go check it out. I'm, I'm blanking out on what it's going to. There might be a default implementation of what it calls. So here, well, I guess this is a default implementation. It's just not what I expected. Um, <clears throat> we have a form valid that will be called by the form view when is valid is true. And this is our opportunity to actually save something. And the thing we're trying to save, remember, we're trying to make a connection between a student and a, a task. And that thing is coursework. So we're going to need a save method that will um, actually create the coursework. Or it needs to also be smart and look for an existing coursework and update that if it exists. Those are the things that we need to check. So we need a couple more tests before we're really done. And we'll say test save new coursework. <clears throat> Okay, and a new coursework is uh, created for a student and task. And we've already checked the clean state, so we want um, we want the same kind of data that's up here, this valid state, in order to do the work. And so we've got this. The uh, the difference between this is now, I, I typically follow the uh, AAA test pattern. And that stands for arrange, act, and assert. So as you've been reading my tests along with me, uh, you may not have noticed it, but I always space them out in the same way. And that way is to say, um, here's the arrangement. And that means all of the data set up. So that's this first block at the top. Then a space, and then this middle line. This is the act. And then the third is the actual assertion section. Um, so that pattern, I think, is a useful one. It, it makes my tests very clear about what they're trying to actually test. So when we get down to this create new coursework, the arrangement, we actually need to call form is valid as a precondition. So that's that's um, just the way to go. And so now we want to say the action that I want to act upon is a form save method. Save method doesn't exist. It's not something that just comes with a form by default. Um, is that true? Well, is, that, is that true of a model form? Hmm. I might be lying about a model, model form. It might have a default save action. In which case, maybe it's doing the right thing. We'll, we'll have to play with this. Um, so what we want to come out of the bottom here is we want there to be a coursework. So we want to assert that there's a coursework that matches this the necessary input conditions. So that's object filter and student equal student. And there's a course task um, equal to course task. And I guess we could check the completed date, but frankly, I don't feel like it. So we want to assert that this is true. So let's just say assert that it exists. Uh, which we, I guess we need the coursework model. Hmm. Okay. Um, from homeschool students models import coursework whoops 
not object, it's objects. Now notice it didn't it didn't fail on the save call, so it tells me that there is a save method. All right, that's interesting. So it'd be really nice if we didn't have to if we didn't have to do any extra work. If we could just call save on this model form and be done. Don't know if that's the case or not. We're about to find out. So the other condition is, and, and frankly, if this is the case, I might actually delete these tests because what are they, t like if we can prove to ourselves that the model form is doing its job, why am I testing the model form? Like I'm, I would be just testing save and there's really no value to it. In fact, I'm not, I'm gonna assume that maybe we can get away with not doing this. And so let's go ahead and create, um, well, oh, junk. I'm afraid of a couple of things. What am I afraid of? This model form takes three attributes, student, course task, and completed date. And what happens if I change one, like I could have the student and course task be the same consistently. What happens if we change the completed date? Am I gonna create a new coursework with a, with a different completed date value? That would be not so great. Um, I don't know that if I have a unique constraint, unique to, together on the student and course task. So there's other, there's other things that we gotta figure out. So let's go back to the student's models and look at the coursework for a moment. Um, yeah, I don't have any constraint on this. So there's ways that you can add a constraint that will say that the student and course task must be unique together. You can't have more than one of them. That might be something worth adding for this form. I don't know if it'll do the right thing, but we could try it um, if it doesn't give us the behavior that we want. Uh, it might just raise a different kind of error. I'm not really sure. And we want to check, let's actually do it this way. So we'll do count, if it count equals one, then it's a singular coursework, but let's do a coursework factory. And pass it the student and the course task. And we gotta import that thing, of course. Uh, all right. <clears throat> what? Do I not have a factory for this? Oh man. Bummer. All right, let's go see if there's a factory. No, there is. I just typed something incorrectly. Oh, that's schools. Hmm. Okay. I'm just in the wrong spot. Yeah. Put it in the wrong spot. Okay. Yeah, that was what I was afraid of. Okay. What happened? What happened is we told it to make one, and it dutifully made one, but it made another one. Okay. Is there... What we really want is to update an existing coursework. And this is where we might need to override the save method on the form because it's not quite doing what we want. But before we do that, sorry, just whack the mic. Before we do that, let's go, let's go check on the model form implementation of save and take a look at some Django for a little bit and see if it is helpful. So I have a local clone of Django because I look at enough that it's valuable. So we're going to open that up and we're going to look for the model form class in here.
And it's got the form mixin and the single object mixin. Is there a save method in here? Uh, come on. Where, I bet it's in the form mixin, maybe. I don't know. Hold on. We're going to keep hunting. I don't know if this is the right spot right now, but we're going to check for a minute. Yeah, I think we're going to have to be a little more creative. Well, rats. They're doing the right thing for most circumstances. I, I should just be really, really clear about that. I think that uh, the the action there is appropriate. Um, it's just not quite the behavior that we want in the circumstance. And there's probably some clever way to do essentially what we're looking for is like a insert or update kind of operation and i don't know that that really exists with model form we can poke around django insert or update create or update there's a get or create I know this exists. I just don't know that it's going to work with a model form. Get or create model form. Yeah, they're pretty much this person's pretty much just saying what I was thinking was going to happen. And this isn't even right. <laughs> Be careful with Stack Overflow. So the reason that this is wrong is the I think that I think this is wrong is that they're creating this instance in this example based off of any attributes in there, which means that this book has to match exactly. So for for our scenario that we're talking about, we want to fetch. Um, if there is a student in task, but we would like to update if there is a different date that's been inserted, uh, if it's been changed. So that's be careful. Just be careful what you find on Stack Overflow. It's I, I generally love Stack Overflow. It's a good resource, but just got to be watch out for it sometimes. Um, okay, so this is close to right. Um, this test is basically right if we take out the course factory. Um, I'm going to make a new test I'm going to leave it as one I'm just going to take out this attribute so this should pass I think what? oh that's because it followed this one maybe um, we'll do that try this Good, the test passed. Let me check on that link. Skelio. Cello. I'm I'm sorry. Um Oh, this is cool. Is this the the same docs that are this looks like the same docs from Django Project, just in a slightly different format. I've never heard of this site before. It's kinda cool. Nice. I, I've never used that before. I've never encountered this site, but um, that doesn't mean it's not good. It looks kind of nice. Nice and clean. Um, okay, so we've got this test. This works in the scenario with one, and but we want it to be in this scenario with two, um, or with an, with an existing one, and also return one. 
but it's returning two. So that's what's wrong. All right, so we do need to make a save method after all. We're going to write our own save method. And we're going to do save. And I don't think we even need to take any arguments. Uh, so we'll say create or update a coursework. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think I'd, I may want to use get or create. That might be the right action. We just have to be a little bit more careful than that stack overflow. Um, yeah, well, I, and I always get it backwards too. So let's go read the documentation on get or, get or create because it's it takes some parameters which are are um, there's two two kind of modes to it of, of parts that you want to use for lookup and parts that you want to update and I always get it wrong on what those parts are Because there's this defaults thing, and I can't remember if defaults is where you want the values that aren't going to change, or it might not even be this one. It might be, is it update or create? Oh man, I, I could be even just using the wrong one and misleading you all. Yep, update or create. Okay, so here's the pattern. <clears throat> Again, I think I because I I don't use this often enough. I have to stare at it every single time. Um, so you can see this pattern is it's kind of it's looking up. Well, let me let me just read this. I, I need to focus, and I know sometimes it's hard for me to like read docs and talk to you all. So I apologize. We're just gonna quietly read together for a second. Hopefully that's not too boring for you. Um, and we'll see. Okay, so it's trying to fetch based on the keyword arguments. If a match is found, it updates the things passed to defaults. That's what I always get, I, don't, I can never remember, is it looking based on defaults or is it the other? So I think what we want is um, coursework dot objects dot update or create and we want to look up the student um, <laughs> uh, yeah my I'm gonna be honest with you I have very limited knowledge of Django with machine learning um, my my feeling is probably so here's what i know roughly about machine learning machine learning is a bunch of data analysis right and um, you're generally trying to parse through a ton of data to generate some kind of model that you can then use so i think the answer to your question is is do you already have a model that you're trying to just utilize um if so, I think there might be like clients that can kind of just read that model and take action. But again, I could be just talking nonsense. Um, if if it's you have to build the model and... <laughs> hey, Stu Pack, welcome. I'm, I'm, I still haven't done the, uh, the dark theme. <laughs> I'm doing great, thank you. Um, if you have to build the model, then... I, you know, I don't have a, a fantastic answer for you. I think that gets pretty complicated with um, pipelines and and do you which kind of background workers are well suited for that? And it's probably not necessarily something like salary. You might need whole um, tools like Luigi that has all all that stuff. 
um, you have the model but don't know if it, so I guess my question for you Chelio is is uh, how what is what are you trying to to do with the model is, is it something you like you have a model and you want Django to display it on a web page if if that's your what you're looking for then that seems doable if there's a client that can read the model pretty easily um, but I don't, I don't know that I have a whole lot I can offer beyond that but that would be my thought is that if, if you already have a model then I think Django should be capable of processing data from that and and displaying st stuff based on it but uh, I don't have a great answer I, I gotta believe that it's possible because if you think about um, companies like Instagram are I know I don't know how much they're they've they've pretty dramatically changed how they have used Django over the years as they've had scaled big big scaling issues but you gotta believe that there's machine learning all over the place with that company um, would be my guess so yeah I, I gotta believe it can be done I just don't know the best ways to do it and I would love to learn more at some some future point but I've I've yet to hit a case that I really need machine learning so we're going to do our update or create here. Um, yeah, no problem. We'll do our update or create, and we'll say course task, course task. Those are the two lookup fields that we care about. So we want to create if, we want to update if those two things match already, and we want to create if uh, they don't match. Um, so the last thing we need is this defaults dictionary, and defaults is equal to, um, completed date and we pass it in uh, self cleaned data completed date I think that's what we want um. <laughs> oh, I, I wrote something unparsable oops There it is, okay. So we have a save, and I'm goofing all this stuff up. A student is not just something that's magically accessible. So we need clean data, student, and we need clean data course task. And the precondition for calling save, like the conventionally, remember save is just a conventional thing, is you would, you would not call this method unless you validated. And so by the time you validate, it'll have gone through all the other checking and clean should actually have values at that point. If it doesn't, you're, you're breaking the, the contract that, that uh, these, these things are trying to offer. So I think this is the right call. I think it ends up being pretty a uh, pretty nice little short and sweet save method. If I did it right, um, we'll check. Got one. Actually, let's go back up to the top of this test. Test the whole thing. Great. Got all four in half, less than half a second. That's exciting. So that means that we now have a save. Okay. We might be at a, a, a breaking point for at least my brain. We'll we'll talk about it for a minute and see where we have to go, and maybe maybe uh, the rest of this goes in a future stream. I'm not really sure yet. Um, we now have a form that will clean all the stuff. It will um, save it if you want to, which is good. You know what? Let's let's keep going. We, I can power through this because we're we're so close. We're like. We've got, I think, all the major pieces. We just need to wire the last few things together. So let's, I think our form is done. Aside from this to-do, which again, this is like, I can handle this later when I don't have to bore you with silly uh, validation stuff. So we're going to go back to our forms, or excuse me, our views. And I'm going to make less sense as this goes on, y'all, but I'm doing my best. Um, we're going to go to the coursework form view and we have our template. Oh, we're definitely not going to get all this done because this has got the, um, we haven't touched the template all yet. Okay. Well, we're going to, what we're going to do, <laughs> let's, let's draw a line in the sand then. 
where we'll end this stream this evening is getting the view stuff together so that the form and the view are all talking nicely and add the behavior. And um, I think that gets us pretty darn close. I think there might be a couple things with like dealing with next parameters and some other stuff, uh, but that's that's okay. So um, what we're still looking for is the uh, connecting the form valid callback to the save method. So that's the, the other piece. So let's return to the test views. And we have our, our get here, but we really need to do a post. Um, and that will be, where should we put that? Let's put, I like to like have these other kind of tests, these fringe checking tests be sort of the bottom if I can. And in my test case, I always want to check that the authentication, the access controls there, I want to test the happy path case for doing a get request to make sure that's working. And then I want to test the case for a post and make sure that that is also working. Um, those are important. The question is, is how, how am I building up the data or um, what I want to pass to this form? That's really, that's probably one of my bigger questions because I don't want anybody tampering with the post data. In fact, I might not even put the post data into the template. Um, what am I talking about? So remember, there are three um, parameters that are going into this coursework. All that the user really has to provide is the completion date. The other stuff of the task itself and the student are going to be coming from the URL because we've got the UUIDs up there. So I think that I, I'm going to assume that the way I'm actually going to do this for the how the stuff gets built is I'm going to make the view pass in the proper IDs. Um, and if that's not clear, you'll see it in a second, I hope. So let's say test post and um, a post creates a coursework. I'm not going to test. We don't need now because we have the form test. We don't need to check both the create and update case because we tested those in, the, in that other spot. But this is kind of the end to end test to make sure everything is working at, at to my desired expectations. So we have the post. Um, I'm going to create all the necessary uh, data to start and paste it in here. And we want to have a response and we want to check that the response is a 302. Um, that's, that's saying it's going to be doing a, um, a valid redirect. Actually, I think there's even a better method for that. There's a assert. Uh, what is it? No, 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 no. Response. There it is. All right. Assert response 302, I think. Okay. And delete that. So here's our new test. It's not going to be a check. It needs to be a post. So that's all good. And then we need to pass in a data dictionary. And the data, this is where we need to get a little different. The, the data, as I said, I want to pass in um, I want to pass in the date, the completed date. And so that I make this test like continue to work in the future, I want I need to pass in. There's oh man, there's more checking I forgot to do. We're not going to finish it all. Dang it! There's more stuff. <laughs> um, here's what I forgot. Uh, well, we'll get to this in a second. For now, we'll just say comp course the we'll give it the course start date. Okay, 
We have a data dictionary. Before I forget, I'm going to come back to the, the forms and I'm going to leave myself another to-do. We forgot a thing to check. And we were so focused on correcting uh, or making sure that the student and course tasks were correct that we forgot about the completion date. So what if the completed date is outside of the school year? So somebody types in, you know, 111 one, one, as in like the beginning of when we started rec I mean that's not really accurate but a long time ago then that would be um, bad and so we need to make sure that that is within the bounds it's going to complicate stuff but we're going I'm going to ignore that that's more validation that you all can go look at my commits in the future because I'll probably work on it this week while I'm offline so we've got our post and um, the other thing we need to check is we need to check that there is we want to assert that there's a coursework that matches the uh, student and the course task. There's got to be at least one when we're done. Or actually, not at least. We want exactly one. And we need to import the coursework which is in the students' models. All right, let's try it out. It failed. The course has no attribute start date. Whoops. Um, well, shoot. You don't? Day of week model? Ah, uh, what's going on? It doesn't. It doesn't know when it's running. That's not surprising. Okay, I screwed that up. So, but I do know that the the school year does. So we can do we can change this to grade level school year. That has a start date for sure. Hey, Code Alite, thanks for coming in. I appreciate your questions. It was really thoughtful. Thanks for sticking around. Okay, we did a post, and if you looked at it, you saw that it said a 200 instead of a 302. What that's telling me, most likely, is that there were form errors. Um, so let's do let's add that extra assertion here. So we'll say, well, can we get the form errors? It's going to be in the context. So for now, we can we can just confirm. So since it was a three hundred two, it's going to or a, a two hundred, it's going to have the form in the context, and we could say, um, assert not errors and we'll see some stuff probably okay that's exactly what I was hoping to see so here's where we're going to go into the the actual form view and give it these extra parameters I'm I, I deliberately left them off of the data the payload because I want the view to be able to provide that from the URL parameters so that way it makes it tamper proof so nobody can submit form data that includes somebody else's student and somebody else's course task and monkey with that and cause me to validate yet another thing um, by limiting it to um, building that ourselves into the view uh, we bypass that problem but in order to do that, we have to override, I think it's the get form keyword args, I think. That's where we need to go back to the classy class page view. So we need to make sure we call the super on that. And pass in, or maybe this is get initial. I always get these mixed up. Return the initial data. 
What's the prefix? I don't know what that means. I don't remember what that means. No, no, no. It is, it's definitely in the keyword arguments because the initial, that's something else. So we don't want the initial. The initial is like if you were populating the form for the first time and wanted to print it out there, which I don't think we really want to do. I want to put it in the keyword arguments. So we need self keyword, form keyword arguments, and we want to call um, super and get the form keyword arguments. And let's return those. Just make sure we'll run the test again. It's going to still blow up, but I want to make sure that I called this appropriately at least. Okay, so it didn't blow up in a new way because we didn't mess that up. Um, this is where we want um, we're going to have to extract here. So we want a cache property that I'm going to call student and I'm going to take this, put it here, and change this to, oh, I seriously don't have cache property here. That's a bummer. Okay, so returning that, and cached property comes from, Django utils functional. Cache property, as the name kind of suggests, is it makes it a property. And so that we can do this, we can do self.student. So it's going to be uh, like an attribute access, but it's going to execute property method. And the caching of it is so that it won't calculate it more than once, because this is doing a, a database query. And the reason I'm putting it here is because we're going to update the keyword args with the extra information that was missing. So I'm going to say student is self dot student right here. Okay. So hopefully that made sense of I'm just extracting this out and so that it can be used both in the get context made it method and the get form keyword args method. If I run the test again, hopefully we're down to one error. Mm, shoot. Form class got an unexpected keyword argument student. Okay. Well, stinker. That's not, not a keyword argument for the form. It is, does it go in initial? That doesn't seem right. Maybe it is. All right. Maybe it's initial. See if I would get initial anywhere else. Yeah, I have a few of them. Okay. We'll just tweak this around to use initial. All right, try again. Ooh, I messed up. I'm getting tired, y'all. I can tell. I'm making, I'm starting to make silly mistakes that I should be able to catch. I didn't even do it right. So what? What happened there? We have, in theory, I thought that passing in the student um, 
would populate that field so that it wouldn't act as required in the data. I'm disappointed that that does not appear to be the case. Hmm. Is it one of these other methods? So I think the problem is is that the the initial okay this might be it. The initial is only used on the get request, as I, as I think I mentioned. Or, or I, I maybe didn't mention it, but it's now coming back to me. That's why putting it in initial is not the right spot. So I thought I could do it with keyword arguments, but that's clearly not correct either. And so get form keyword arguments. This is maybe, maybe it was the right thing to do to put it in form keyword arguments, but I put it in the wrong spot. What we need to do is replace the request post with a different dictionary. All right. And maybe I have, let me see if I have other examples of this because, well, I might maybe if I did, I got rid of them. Or no, or did I search for the wrong thing? I think I just searched for the wrong thing. I did. Again, that's that's what fatigue does to you. So that's adding the adding an attribute of the keyword arguments. That's not what I'm looking for. All right, I don't think I'm going to find it quickly, but I think I know what I want to do. I want to take the form keyword arguments, and so let's rename these again. Go back to form keyword arguments and call this quargs again. Now, the difference is what? On, we've got to be careful with this too. It needs to be the right method. On a post, I need to update this with the data attribute. Now that's probably something I could realistically search for. Hmm. Maybe not as fast as I would like, though. Okay. Well, we won't go off past effort, past work. <clears throat> so if self request is a method is equal to post then we want to do um, we want to insert our data into the actual post data so we know that the keyword args from calling super already has the data key and so i want to say um, data is equal to um, we want to copy, I think we want to copy the post because what if I tried to do this, if I tried to say keyword args data and then tried to insert the student in here directly, well, let's just do it. And so you see what happens. I think it's going to tell me that that is immutable. The query dict is immutable. So what you have to do is this little song and dance where you pull out the data as a copy. So we say, I think what, and I think you can call copy on the query dict. I think that works. So we'll say data copy. And now we can say, um, we can add the student and then at the end replace data 
with this new copy. I think that works. What? Did I, oh, I still have this thing. That line's wrong. Excellent. That's, that is right. That's what we wanted. Because look, the student is no longer as a, this field is required. So we put that in properly. So really, it's not just, and it's not just, I mean, I could set this attribute by attribute. That's kind of annoying though. So we can do an update and turn this into a dictionary like this and course task of self course task, which we ha don't have yet. So we'll, we'll get there. Um, and if we run this test right now, it's going to fail because course task is not a property. So it doesn't know what that is. So we're going to take this chunk of code right here and move that down here and we'll say um, cache property def course task and now we're going to return this and add a self onto here. So I think you can see that the impact of this is it starts to make the context really clear. In fact, we could probably do an update on this. We could continue to refine, get it down to one line. Why don't we? Let's do that and say context, update. Okay. The student is not enrolled in this course. Okay, that's, well, we're at least getting somewhere. The, we're missing the enrollment that we put in that other form. So we'll, we can go, um, we've got this, and we can return to the form, get the enrollment to show that these are connected. And now run this. Ah, okay, We're almost at the end. This is like the finish line. So we need to give it a place to go to. And that means we need a success URL. So let's look for get success URL. There's gotta be one in here somewhere. And we're at this, we've got, I'm gonna keep all of these get methods together because they're the interface that goes with this form. And we've got a get success URL. So where does this go back to? That's the question. We want it to go back to the student's uh, course view, which took as the arguments, it took the student's UUID, which was in this view, it was just the UUID and the course task UUID. So that's gonna be, um, we can say self course task course UUID. Whoops. Oh, no, now, now ours is passing. Now it's doing a, now this form is not in the errors because it's actually doing the 302. So we delete that. And, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I forgot to save the thing. Good thing we wrote a test, right? Um, so the view is all cleaned up. I think this is pretty darn close to where we want to be. The last thing to do is we need to actually on the form valid, this is one of the hooks that's there. It's going to take the form and we want to say form.save. And that will cre that should create the coursework or update the existing one. Oh, but it's supposed to return. Um, so we need to call form.save and then we want to return the super call. 
form valid form. Finally, all right. That was a lot. <laughs> but what seemed, so I guess the summary of this is that what seemed like this not very challenging feature of can we click a little calendar icon, come to a page that will let us set a date, save a thing so that it completes the task for a student, was a whole new form, a whole new view, a view that required custom logic, um, a lot of tests. There's more validation that I haven't even done yet. Um, so it was a bunch of stuff. Hopefully you found that journey enjoyable, uh, or at least you understand everything that went that goes into this. It's not, and this is just, well, just I don't want to trivialize it. This is this is what it takes to make a server rendered view of this. Imagine the effort that would happen if you had a JavaScript based version. So not only would you have to do some form stuff instead of making a view, because we haven't even touched the template yet. Instead of making a view you would make an API, and it would do some JSON serialization. Uh, and then you'd have to go over into JavaScript land and do all of these kind of things and make handling code over on that side too. So I think it's just trade-offs of what you prefer. Um, I do think that in the end, this ends up being pretty tight and clean, and it's going to be very well covered in, in test coverage. Um, there's, I think there's a, more to do. Like there's a get a next parameter and return to that is a, something that's going to, I can almost guarantee that my wife's going to be asking for that because she's not going to want to just be dumped right back to where she was. She's going to want to see um, the item that she had just clicked. So there's that. Um, so there's there's additions that need to be made here. There's, ver uh, there's refinements on the checking um, to make sure that there are those extra edge conditions about completion dates being out of bounds and all these sort of things. Uh, but that's been this flow, and that's that's what feature development on this project looks like. Um, I, I think I'm my my brain is totally fried at this point. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, journey. Um, I will take this content, post it up on YouTube if you're still around. And um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you're watching on YouTube later, uh, give me a like or uh, subscribe down below. That'd be really awesome. I think that would um, help me um, be discovered by more people. And I just want to say thank you for joining in, and I will see you next time. Take care.